so thankful to see everyone this morning. It's great to be, be here worshiping God. If you'll stay right there for just a second, in Revelation chapter 3. I uh, appreciate Tom reading that for us. And um, The church at Laodicea, we're not going to be here for long, just kind of as a segue into what we're talking about this morning. It's the first Sunday of the month, uh, and so we will be in our Romans 12 theme uh, in just a few moments. But in Revelation chapter 3, we're faced with a congregation, the church at Laodicea, that simply does not see themselves clearly. They do not see themselves as God sees them. They have all the confidence in the world, but they're basing their confidence on all the wrong things. And the Lord says in this condition that they're essentially useless to him. The, 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 the city of Laodicea is well known uh, so much. It gives a testament to the fact that the Laodiceans, though it was a very rich, a very wealthy city, they were widely known for their very poor water. There were places nearby where there were hot springs, where springs would spring up really hot water, which of course has its uses, um, and we recognize that hot water is used for bathing, it can be used for medicinal purposes. There were also places nearby where there would be fresh springs of water feeding cities, and that cool water was perfect for drinking, and of course other uses as well, but, but Laodicea was very wide known for having water that was channeled into the city through stone channels. And it came from far away. And by the time it got there, it was two things. It was lukewarm and it was dirty. Uh, they've actually gone back, archaeologists, and they've actually gone in and, and found some of these stone channels that brought water into the city. And it's, uh, it is clear that the water had large degrees of sediment and lime a limestone in the water supply, and it was, just, it was just terrible water. And it's interesting that that's the image that our Lord here uses to say, it's, I think a lot of times we go to this passage and we say, well, it's, God wants you to be hot. It's not cold. He wants you to be hot. He wants you to be on fire for the Lord. That's not really the idea, because if you look at the text, he says, I wish you were either hot or cold. Either one is better than what you are. Um, He's simply saying that I wish that you were useful. I wish that you were good for something, for this purpose, for that purpose, for that purpose. I wish you were fruitful. I wish you were effective. I wish you were seeing yourselves clearly. You were measuring yourselves by the right standard and not blind to the true condition in which you are. But as you are right now, he says, there's nothing good for me to do except spit you out of my mouth. So what I wish you would do is see your right condition. I wish you would be zealous and I wish you would repent and I wish you would live the life that I've called you to live and be the people that I've called you to be. And when you flip back over to Romans chapter 12 in our theme, that's essentially the idea, right? To see ourselves clearly in light of verse 2 of Romans, 1, uh, Romans chapter 12, in light of what is good, what is acceptable, and what is perfect. To renew our minds according to what God says is true and acceptable, that we might be transformed into the image that He's called us to. Let's just read the passage to remind ourselves. I know we've got it memorized at this point, but, but let's just read it anyway. It's Romans 12, our theme for the year, beginning in verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, what is acceptable, and what is perfect. It's the idea of a living sacrifice of bringing the whole of who we are into conformity to the image of God through Christ Jesus, to thinking about the mercies of God and responding appropriately. Is it appropriate for us to see the mercies of God, chapters 1 through 11, and then show up to worship on Sundays and sometimes Bible class on Wednesdays, but the rest of the week we just live as if we haven't a concern in the world for what the Bible says is true. It's not appropriate at all. He says, I appeal to you by God's mercies. Bring the whole, the absolute whole of who you are to God as one who is not throwing things on the altar of God, but climbing on, laying down, and staying there for the glory of God. And so what he does after that is he begins to explain what it looks like to be living sacrifices. The first place he starts is when God saves you, when God shows you the grace that brings you into fellowship with Him, it also brings you into fellowship with other believers. He puts, he puts living sacrifice living within the context of the local church. And if you remember what we talked about then, 
It's the idea that God intends to change the way we think. We need to think humbly about ourselves. Number two, we need to see that we are a significant part of the Lord's body. And number three, we have a part to play. We have work to do. We were saved that we might be zealous for good works, Titus chapter 2. We talked about love and the mark of being a Christian and how that looks like. And, and, and we look there in verse 9, it says, let love be genuine. We don't want to be people who can say the words but not feel the feelings towards those with, we, with whom we've been brought into this bond with. We need to let our love be sincere. We need to train our hearts to love truly, to have brotherly affection, to really feel the brotherly, sisterly bond, to show honor to one another, hospitality to one another, contribute to the needs of one another, and we went to chapter 13 a little bit after that, and we talked about how the fullness of the law is fulfilled in this word. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, verse 10. It is the fulfilling of the law. This morning, I want to focus on a very short, a very concise, a very simple phrase that um, I thought about bringing more into this lesson but at the same time, I, I think there's things to be explored in this, especially as it relates back to where we're starting, and it's in verse 11. If you look in verse 11, the ESV is what I'm reading from. Verse 11, it simply says this, Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. You know, very simple, three part, three part are there. Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit and serve the Lord. You know, I think a lot of times our struggle is to get this formula upside down sometimes. We're, we're not slothful in zeal for certain things. We're fervent in spirit towards certain things, but the context of that zeal and that um, fervent spirit is not always the service of the Lord. I think a lot of times we get more excited about lots of other things oftentimes than drawing near to God and, and, and encouraging our relationship with the Lord and spending time with God in prayer and in fellowship with His Word and in fellowship with believers and in entertaining thoughts about God. We'd much rather talk about, I don't know, sports. We'd much rather talk about hunting. We'd much rather talk about fishing. We'd much rather talk about work or school or this or that. We'd much rather give our time to all of these other pursuits. We are fervent in spirit. We are diligent and we are zealous. And it's oftentimes, I think, sometimes the things that pertain to God, which just happen to be the things that are the only things that matter, that sometimes get kind of pushed and shoved to the back burner. And you can really see the connection between this simple phrase back to the very beginning with where we started. That's the struggle that we struggle with, isn't it? It's about bringing the whole of who we are within the spectrum of being a Christian and being of the saved and being a partaker of the mercies of God. This is part of the struggle that we struggle with when he says in chapter 12 and in verse 2, not to conform to the things of this world. We identify there's a problem that we have to continually be guarding ourselves against. As a matter of fact, Jesus said in the parable of the sower, right? In the context of the, the seed that was thrown and cast among thorny ground, the, 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 the thorns sprung up and choked it out. And what does he say? Well, it's the cares and the concerns of the world. It's the anxieties over the things of the world. It's the love of the things of the world that slowly begin to choke the word out because the formula has been forgotten. The foundation has been forgotten. What matters has been forgotten. And in Romans chapter 12 and in verses 1 and 2, he's saying, don't forget the thing. It's not just the most important thing. It is the thing. That you come from God and it is to God that you will go and you will stand before. See His mercies and there you will find motivation for all Christian living. But realize that day by day you are to see your life as being brought into the realm 
of what is good and what is acceptable and what is perfect to God. Do not be slothful in zeal, he says. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. This is going to come within the context of everything we've studied about and everything we will continue to study about, whether that's how I, how I serve in the local church, whether it's how I love those who are around me, whether it's how I, which we'll go here next, how I respond to my enemies when I'm enduring persecution, how, to re, how do I react with that? This is one of the things that we have the obligation to continue to do in times of persecution. It's going to inspire, verse 12, rejoicing in hope, being patient in tribulation, being constant in prayer, because we know it's the Lord that's going to hold us. This is our obligation in Romans chapter 13 in our submission to the authorities. We're in chapter 14 in how we deal with one another in matters where we don't see eye to eye. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Let's break this down just a little bit, and let's just kind of talk about very briefly this morning what this is going to mean. Number one, do not be slothful in zeal. That word slothful is pretty self-explanatory, isn't it? It's the idea of lazy. It's the idea of, of not putting forth effort or not pushing forward. And the Proverbs have so much to say about this. For instance, in Proverbs 13.4, Proverbs 13.4, the soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, while the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. Proverbs 10 and in verse 4, a slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. Proverbs 24, 30 to 34, I passed by the field of a sluggard, by the vineyard of a man lacking sense. And behold, it was all overgrown with thorns. The ground was covered with nettles. Its stone wall was broken down. And I saw and considered it and looked and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. How many of you, just examine and test yourself in your own heart, how many of you, when you read that, does that describe your pursuit of spiritual things. When we talk about drawing near to God, are we talking, talk about what Chris talked about earlier and pressing forward to, uh, straining forward towards the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus? Or we talk about growing in grace and knowledge and just, just continually seeking to draw near to God and be effective and, and be fruitful? Or 2 Peter 1, one of our other themes, adding to our faith. As we talk about this process of growth that God calls us to, for how many of us does that picture right there form a pretty accurate description? In Proverbs 19 and in verse 15, slothfulness cast into a deep sleep and an idle person will suffer hunger. Or lastly, Proverbs 14 and 13, in all toil there is profit. But mere talk lends only to poverty. There is a consistent warning throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament about being idle, about being lazy, about being slothful. Whether that is in our day-to-day work life, we need to do everything as unto the Lord, of course. But especially as pertains to the things that matter, godliness and holiness. The Greek word for slothful is actually used only three times uh, in the New Testament. The first time um, it's actually used is in Philippians chapter 3, or not the first time, one of the other times that it's actually used in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 1, it's used to portray a, a reluctance or a hesitancy. Uh, so there Paul is saying, I'm not reluctant or hesitant to write to you because I'm doing it for your own good. But ironically, in Matthew chapter 25 and in verse 26, Matthew 25 and 26 is the other place. So other than Romans 12, 11 and Philippians 3, 1, where it's that reluctancy, we have in Matthew 20, 25 and 26, within the story of the parable of the talents, the other usage of this word. Let's just flip over there for just a second. Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 25, we have the parable of the talents. We have one who was given five talents. We have one who was given two talents. And of course, we have the one who was, giving, who was given one. The two first, the five and the two talent man, of course, went out and they doubled what they had been entrusted with as stewards. But in verse 24, he who also had received one talent, he came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went, and I hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what's yours. 
But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I did not sow, and gather where I have scattered no seed. And you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will, be, he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing. After he, I, bringing this out just simply to paint this very clear picture of what God thinks of the one who is lazy and the one who is slothful in their service to him. You know, obviously, big idea of this text is we have God as the, the master, and he's called us, each one, as stewards. He's given us responsibilities that must be bore out in our work, walk with the Lord. It's not just that he saved us to save us, he saved us to use us, to be useful in his service. And that's what Romans 12 is all about. Living sacrifices. Living sacrifices. We're not dead sacrifices as the lifeless ones who cannot move, but the ones who are to move from this point forward for the glory of God in all things. We are alive and we are to be as living sacrifices, the instruments of righteousness for God in this world. And we are to do it, do it without exception. And we are to do it unrelenting until our time on this life is over, at which we are promised the place of rest. Matthew chapter 25 and in verse 26, his master said, you wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Well, slothful in what? Well, he uses the word zeal here in the ESV, but it's synonymous with the idea of earnestness or diligence or in striving. In verse 11, it places this, of course, within the context of serving the Lord. Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. But remember, the whole of this section is a description of what it means to be a living sacrifice, being transformed by the renewal of the mind in accordance with what God sees as good and acceptable and perfect. This is our context. It's basically that I, the idea that in the context of your service to the Lord, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and in verse 10, we find that saying, whatever your hand finds to do, with, do it with all your might. Also, we have it uh, given to us in, <clears throat> in the New Testament, in Colossians, uh, for instance. In Colossians chapter 3, uh, bond servants obey in everything those who are your old earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily is for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive an inheritance as your reward. For you are serving the Lord Christ. The wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done. There is no partiality. The idea is simple. It's this. We've been called by the gospel of Jesus Christ by his mercies, and we have come and we have made that good confession that we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. And in our confession, we also brought our commitment. We repented, right? We said, from this point forward, I'm going to live my life for the Lord. I'm going to live my life as a living sacrifice. And in a climactic way, what we did is we responded to the, to the grace of God through baptism, being baptized for the forgiveness of our sins, that we might be a new creature in Christ Jesus. When we obeyed the gospel, when we were converted, do we not see that this is the work that our hand chose to do. This is the work to which we committed ourselves from this point forward till death do we part. To give ourselves in complete and absolute service to the Lord, to not be slothful in it, to be fervent in our spirit, to be truly living sacrifices, always being renewed and transformed into the image of our eternal God. I think there are some reasons sometimes that we struggle with this. I think there's some reasons we kind of struggle with this. And we get, get to places where we don't feel on fire for the Lord. And we don't feel enthusiastic about the things of God. And I think that's really the idea. When we get to the end of this this morning, I'm going to kind of give you a different translations rendering of this word, uh, of this, this verse, which is accurate. It's just a little bit different. But the word that it uses is enthusiastic. And I like that word. I think it portrays the idea here of not being slothful in zeal, being fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. The idea is don't be lazy, work hard, serve the Lord enthusiastically. 
Because we understand the way in which we serve makes all the difference in the world. The parent knows that of a, uh, of a child to tell a child to do something, even for its own good. For the child to hang its head and to go, oh, I can't do that, to drag its feet and to take 30 minutes doing something that should take two minutes is not acceptable. It shouldn't be acceptable. Because we don't want to just train actions. We want to train the spirit of that child, the attitude, the mentality, the disposition. I think we understand when we just think about it for just a moment, there are, time, there are reasons why sometimes we become lazy in our efforts to serve the Lord, in our efforts to do anything, but in our efforts to serve the Lord. I think, and I'm going to acknowledge this, you may disagree, I think some of us come by it a little bit more naturally than others. Maybe we have more of a lazy disposition. Maybe we have a, 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 an attitude or a mentality that's a little bit harder for us to get up and get going, and, and, and we don't have that ambition, and we don't have that drive. I think for some people, it simply does not come as natural, but let me make sure you hear this. It's never an excuse. Because there's a lot of things about Christianity that doesn't come naturally, but God doesn't permit us to use that as an excuse. He rather calls us to overcome what is difficult by the strength, by the grace, by the power of Jesus Christ, and by the Holy Spirit, and, and all that He calls us to. He calls us to stand up and to move forward and to overcome our obstacles. And so while I do believe there are some who simply come by it more naturally than others, I also believe just as much we all must heed the call of the Holy Spirit in this passage. Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. I think there's, there are some other reasons we can offer. Number one, just attitude and mentality. We, can, we, 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 we destroy our attitudes and our mentalities by the ways we look at the world and we interact with the world and we see those who are around us. And, and just like we can renew our minds in the things of God, Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2, so often we renew our minds by the things of the world because we're more focused on the world. But our attitude and our mentality sometimes give us a lack of motivation to get up and get going. And I think he probably is dealing with that a little bit in verse 1 of chapter 12 when he, when he before telling them about the great call of being living sacrifices, he points them back to the first 11 chapters where it talks about the mercies through Jesus Christ. He's trying to help them find the proper motivation because when one is truly in touch with the mercies of God, they ought to wake up every single morning with the question, how can I serve God today? How can I serve Him? I'm alive today simply by Him. I have hope today simply by Him. I have forgiveness today simply by Him. And I realize that I am called today to serve Him in whatever way that I possibly can. If we're truly in touch with the mercies of God, then there we find the motivation to live the life He's called us to. That's why we read in 2 Peter 1, right? That the one who has stopped in his pushing forward to add to his faith in all of these things and has stopped increasing. He says he's so nearsighted that he's blind. He's forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Sometimes it's just the attitude and the mentality that we sink into. Maybe it's a lack of interest. Maybe it's a lack of ambition. Maybe it's fear. Do you remember what said in Matthew 25 and in verse 25? The excuse of the unfaithful servant was... I knew you to be this kind of man, and I was afraid. And a lot of times it is fear that cripples us from serving with fervor and zeal. And it certainly ought not to be the case. Sometimes it's busyness. Sometimes we just simply allow ourselves to be so busy, and it begins to just crowd out the things that are of the highest importance. I immediate, when I was thinking through this, I immediately thought of Matthew 13, verses 43 to 45, the the parable that Jesus tells, the return of the unclean spirit. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest but finds none. And then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house empty, swept, and put in order. And then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits more evil than itself. And they enter and they dwell there, and the last state of the person is worse than the first. So also will it be with this evil Generation. It's just the idea, it's not enough to just cleanse our lives of all defilement. To cleanse our lives of all defilement and then to get busy with all the wrong stuff leaves us at the end of the day with an empty home. Empty of the things that would push the evil out. We fill our lives with busyness 
things that are not necessarily wrong in, of themselves, but we become so busy with good things that we push the best thing out. In this story, he says, the last state is worse than the first. In Ephesians chapter 5, <clears throat> I think when we truly connect with the idea of what Paul is doing in Romans chapter 12, <clears throat> about being living sacrifices and having the renewed minds and being transformed and, uh, to the things of God and not conformed to the things of the world and being, being fervent in our spirit and serving the Lord. I think we walk away with it, <clears throat> away from that realization and that foundation. Um, fully embracing, I hope, fully embracing the significance of what Paul does in Ephesians chapter 5 and in verses 15 through 17. When he says, look carefully how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, for the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Somebody come by it more naturally. I think there's an attitude and mentality aspect of it. Sometimes it's simple Business, but at the end of the day, we realize the reason we become slothful in zeal in all of these things is because we have yet to come to an end of ourselves. We allow the things that we enjoy, the things that we want to think about, the things that we want to do to shove out the things that matters, the necessary thing and the good thing, the chief duty of, of all men, the highest obligation and the greatest honor and blessing of serving the Lord Jesus. But I want to offer to you another one. And this goes in line with our Ephesians 6 study. There's another reason why we slip into slothful zeal, and it's because Satan wants no better than for us to be Christians but unfruitful. Because in the place of a Christian who is unfruitful and unfective, he has us in a place where we feel comfortable and at ease and confident. But he knows as an unfruitful servant, we will be cut off. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and in verse 8, <clears throat> in 1 Peter chapter 5 and in verse 8, it simply acknowledges that there is an adversary. He is the devil. He is prowling around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And I think we need to be very conscious of his presence in this struggle. As we seek to serve the Lord, but to serve the Lord as we are called to serve the Lord with zeal and with fervor, we have to embrace the idea that Satan would know. Uh, would have no greater uh, pleasure than to get us into a place where we can be convinced of our salvation, but in our complacency, he knows that we are lost. We need to be very wary of the adversary and the enemy, and very conscious of his presence and the work that he's trying to do in our lives. And we need to do just as Peter said, resist him. We have the power to resist him through the strength that God supplies through Christ Jesus. We have the power to resist him, and resist him we must. Resist him, we must. In Matthew chapter 12, <clears throat> Matthew chapter 12, going back to our story of the return of the unclean spirit, in Matthew chapter 12, do you think the devil is content in this scenario? Well, absolutely. Why? Because we know the end of the story. The evil spirits return and fill this person's heart seven times worse, or worse than the first, not seven times. Uh, yes, seven other spirits more evil than itself. Verse 45, seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of the person is worse than the first. We have to see in all areas of our lives that as we seek to serve the Lord, Satan is seeking to undermine our efforts, to undercut the things that we are trying to do and we see so often through the Old Testament efforts to serve the Lord that were not accepted. We have Malachi chapter 1. Malachi chapter 1, we have, <clears throat> we have the people who are bringing worship to God. They're bringing sacrifices to God. They're coming to the place of worship. They're bringing their animals. They're doing what they're supposed to do, except not really because they're not bringing them in the right manner, right? We have animals being brought, but they're bringing the ones they don't want. They're bringing the lame. They're bringing the broken and the point is made very powerfully there. It's the idea that you wouldn't even make those sacrifices to your governor. Who are we to think that God is to accept those things? God says just shut the doors down to the place of worship. I would rather not be worshipped at all than be worshipped without the, without the 
zeal, without the diligence, without the enthusiasm, without the wholehearted devotion that I demand and I require. And we think a little bit further into this phrase, be fervent in spirit. The idea of fervent is to boil with heat. It, is to, it means to be hot. And in spirit, most likely here, we talked about this a little bit last week, but this, this is a translation of the word pneuma, and sometimes it means different things. You have to look at the context to understand. Sometimes it's talking about the Holy Spirit. Sometimes it's talking about breath or wind. Sometimes it's talking about the inner disposition of a man. I think that's probably what it's referring to here. Much in the same way as Acts 18.25 speaks of Apollos. When Apollos, he was a man who was competent in the Scripture. He was instructed in the ways of the Lord. He was he was, he was an eloquent man. And it says, in being fervent in the Spirit, verse 25, he spoke and he taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. Now we know that he was explained the, the ways of um, the baptism, uh, you know, of the things of Jesus. But it's simply interesting here to just acknowledge the usage of the phrase and the similarity between what Paul is doing um, in this passage in 12, 11, be fervent in the Spirit. We have an example of that in Acts chapter 18 and verse 25. He was a man, he was a man who had enthusiasm and zeal and desire and fervor to be about doing the Lord's work. It wasn't just that he was eloquent, it wasn't just that he was competent in Scripture, it wasn't that just, he, just that he was instructed, but that he was fervent in spirit is what pushed him to go out and speak and to teach. He was a man that truly saw the, desire, the, the, the blessings of the things of God and the blessing of doing the Lord's work, and he was enthusiastic about it. He had great fervor to be about doing the Lord's work. Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit and serve the Lord. I want to I just draw your attention just very quickly to other places throughout Scripture where this very simple phrase is used, these three words, serve the Lord. The first is in Deuteronomy 10, 12. Deuteronomy 10, 12, and now Israel, <clears throat> what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk with him in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. You might be thinking of Joshua 24 and verse uh, 14 and 15. And Joshua 24 and 14, now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness and put away the gods of your fathers served beyond the river in Egypt and serve the Lord. Um, in, um, I'm sorry, verse, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 12 and in verse uh, 20. And you might notice too in parentheses, I just put, gave you verse 24 as, as well here. But he says, do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. And I love verse 24. I've always kind of clung to this passage. Uh, it's, it just, it's, it's just incredible to me. Only fear the Lord and serve him faithfully. But, but it provides a little bit of the motivation. It's not just an empty call, though that ought to be well enough for us. It's not just an empty call given to us here. Serve the Lord faithfully with all your heart, for consider what great things he has done for you. Can you see how that's kind of a, almost a parallel passage to Romans chapter 12 and verse 1? Consider what the Lord has done. I appeal to you by the mercies of God. Serve him faithfully. Give yourselves as a living sacrifice. It's all connected. It's an incredible thing that we serve a God who doesn't just give us empty calls, but gives us filled field calls. I am a God of mercy who sanctifies you. I have shown you my love. I have shown you my grace. I have sent you my Savior. Now I'm calling you to love as I have loved. In Psalm 2, 11, it says, Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Or Psalm 100 in verse 2, Serve the Lord with gladness and come into His presence with singing. And it's upon that, that verse right there that I want to kind of spring just for a couple of minutes. Just to illustrate the idea that the heart and soul of this text is serve the Lord, but, but it's qualified. It's qualified, right? Just like in Malachi, we, we, we recognize God, does, God doesn't want us just bringing stuff. He wants us to bring what He wants, and He wants us to bring it with the right spirit. Psalm 100 and in verse 2, we're introduced to a guy who is serving the Lord with gladness. Serving the Lord with gladness, coming into His presence with singing. There are actually places you can go to in the Old Testament. I, I was looking at them yesterday, but I didn't write the, the references down. But where it attributes the punishment of the people to being because they came and worshipped without joy and gladness. 
As a matter of fact, so central was this to the, to the core of worship that when God set up the place of meeting and the place of worship, He put people at the door to continually offer uh, praise and thanksgiving and expressions of gratitude and joy and gladness before the Lord. Because the presence of the fervent spirit, the presence of the zeal, the presence of the gladness, the thankfulness, the joy, it makes all the difference in the world. You've heard me use this illustration before. Uh, I think it makes it, very, uh, makes it very relatable. But the, notice, the, the noted English architect, Sir Christopher Wren, was supervising the construction of a magnificent cathedral in London. And a journalist thought it would be interesting to go and to uh, interview some of the various guys who were doing the work on this cathedral. And so he chose three, and he asked them this question. He just simply saying, tell us, what are you doing? The first replied, well, I'm cutting a stone, but I'm just doing it for 10 shillings a day. The next answered, well, I'm putting in 10 hours a day at this job to complete this work. But the third responded to the question, what are you doing in this manner? He says, I am helping Sir Christopher Wren construct one of London's greatest cathedrals. And you can see the distinction between the attitude, and I would say because of just that short bit of information that we have, you could probably see the distinction between the work they were doing. One who takes pride in what he's doing and what he's accomplishing versus one who is only concerned about the negative impact that it has on self. The question this morning is simply this, what's your disposition in your service to the Lord? What's your disposition in your service to the Lord? When we read in Romans chapter 12 that you are to love those who are around you with brotherly affection, and not just that, but you're to outdo one another in showing honor, and you are to show hospitality and contribute to the needs of saints, and even go so far as when you are not lining up in agreement with someone, you're still to bless them instead of curse them. Let me ask you a question. What do you think about that? How do you feel about that? As you come to understand, this is one of the ways in which we serve the Lord. As you examine and test yourself against that, do you see that you are trying to do that, but you're doing it with great slothfulness and laziness, without the zeal and the diligence that so deserves and demands? Well, if that's the case, I'd say we have to go back to the very beginning, and we probably lost our connection with the mercies of God as we failed to see what Jesus has done for us and what God's done for us through the mercies of God through Jesus Christ. What about the instructions to um, repay no one evil for evil and actually to respond to persecution and hatred by blessing people with what is good? What do you think about it when it says, verse 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Leave any vengeance that is to be had to the wrath of God. What do you think about that? What do you think about Romans chapter 13 and this this call to submit to authority? What do you think about that? How do you feel about that in your soul and in a and in, in your spirit, are we pretty lazy and slothful and pumping ourselves full of things that are just going to cause bitterness and wrath to stir in our hearts and our minds, and suddenly we find that our inner disposition is not lining up with Jesus at all? It's just not lining up? How do you feel about Romans chapter 14 when someone, in a matter of personal conviction disagrees with you on something pertaining to opinion or conscience how do you think about those individuals do you see them as lesser than you do you look at yourselves in a haughty way and you just look bitterly at these people because they don't see it the way you see it and they're just just they just don't have it right at all how do you think about those individuals what Romans 12:11 tells us that is, is that it matters. It matters what's in our heart. It's not just about doing things. It's about doing it with the right disposition. What's your disposition in your service to the Lord? Is it diligence, zealous, fervent, or is it forgetful, lazy, and neglectful? If we zoom out a little bit and consider quickly the specific things, Paul, we've talked about and will talk about, is it I have to go to church or is it I am a member of God's glorious church in Christ Jesus? 
And today I get to be with God's people. I get to be stirred up in the way of love and good works for the glory of my Savior. What's the disposition there? Is it, I know this person needs to be visited, or I know this person needs to be served, but man, I just don't know that I can afford to lose that time today. Or is it, there's one of my brethren in need, and I'm so thankful to get to serve them like Jesus served me. You know what, I can make a difference for that person today. Is it, oh, there's a person that I just can't seem to get along with. Or is it, there's a person God put in my life to give me cause to practice and grow in the way in love, way of love. How can I love them today? Is it, wow, the temptations of the world are so heavy, I don't know if I can hold out. Or is it, by the grace of God and the power and strength through my Lord Jesus, I can and I will hold out and I will cling to what I know to be good. The disposition of it all matters, doesn't it? It matters. You know, even Chris talked about earlier about the formation of the mind sometimes in order for us to faithfully fulfill some of the things that God has called us to do. I think that's what he calls us, I think what he says in Romans chapter 12 and 1 and 2, you're going to have to renew your mind if you're going to be engaged in the process of transformation. It's serving the Lord involves not just doing things, but doing things with the right spirit, in the right mind, with the right heart. It's not just about, oh, well, the Bible says I have to to pray for my enemy, so I guess I better do it, but I'm just going to do it in like two seconds just just to check it off. But, But it comes from a heart that is connected to the grace and the mercy of Jesus and it's I want to pray for that individual because they desperately need the help of the Lord. It matters. um, I've told you before um, I wasn't really into it growing up but here lately we've been watching some of the Chronicles of Narnia stuff and I'm, I'm big time into it just because just because I can see all of the figurative biblical stuff and I actually like it and things I actually like it a lot better than some of these modern um, and I, I don't dislike these but uh, modern efforts to tell the story of Jesus where I like the Chronicles of Narnia because it doesn't put faces to it it presents these biblical pictures in figurative ways that, that are just powerful to me and we watched the first one the other night, and um, there's, there's a young man in there, he's named Edward, and he gives into temptation, he gets what he wants from the white witch, which was representative of Satan. And he soon, find, soon finds out that she is an oppressive master. She entices him with what the flesh desires for him, it's especially food and, and, and uh, um, very, very luxurious types of things. She entices him with what the flesh wants from a heart of hatred, though, and he soon comes to figure that out as he begins to be abused by his oppressor. Knowing that to give in is to come under her ownership. And he soon finds out that those fleshly desires are futile, they are vain, and they are worthless. And he comes to experience a life in the fellowship of the one called Aslan, which is a representative of Jesus, the lion in the story. Well, at the end of the movie, uh, one of the characters named Tumless, he says of Aslan, he is not a tame lion. He's not a tame lion. In the first book, actually, it's a little bit different. It's asked of Aslan, is he a safe lion? And the, the answer came back quickly, no, of course he's not a safe lion. And I think what that means is that he's not one to be trifled with. He has proven already to be the victor, therefore he is a terror to all who make themselves his enemy. But in both the book and the movie, those statements are followed by this very simple phrase. And it forms the distinction between the two that we can choose to serve, whether God or the adversary. No, he is not a tame lion, but he is good. He is no oppressor. He is a loving master who walks with and he fights for those who are his. And when you watch the movie, you see in the disposition of all those who are in Narnia, he is a joy to serve and he makes the heart of his people glad. 
Is your heart glad in the Lord? Is He your joy? Do you think daily upon the mercies and the grace of God through Jesus Christ and use it as an opportunity to be perfected and transformed and renewed in your mind to serve Him faithfully and without rest, to do it unrelenting, to not be slothful in zeal, but to be fervent in your spirit and to serve the Lord. Psalm 100 and in verse 2, notice the emphasis, and this is just a small selection. Psalm 102, worship the Lord with gladness, come before Him with joyful songs. Psalm 30, 11 and 12, you have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You've loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness that my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Is that your inner disposition towards your service to the Lord? If it's not, don't give up hope. We can get there. We just got to get to work. We got to get to work. We got to get connected with the mercies of God. We got to get connected with the grace of God. And the more and more we come connected with those things, the more and more we will find the motivation to live this incredible life He's called us to. For our good, but ultimately for His glory. I think it's important to see this is the disposition of the early church in Acts chapter 2 and in verse 46. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. I get the question asked oftentimes, why isn't that we don't look as a church like that? Not the glad and sincere part, but the kind of church where we're always wanting to be together and do things and talk about spiritual things and, 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 and do that. And it's not necessarily just from people here, but from people just, just wider than this. Well, the key's in the text. The key's in the heart. They were doing these things because they were together with glad in sincere hearts. They had just experienced the saving power of Jesus. When they asked the question, what shall we do? And they were responded to by Peter when he says, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. You'll receive the, for, you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. They did it. They received it. They saw the union. They felt the grace of God. They realized what had been done for them in Christ Jesus. And with glad and sincere hearts, Every day, they continued to meet together, and they served the Lord. Finishing up this morning, I'm going to give you the different other translation of this Romans chapter 12 and in verse 11, but I, but I quoted it for you earlier. My encouragement for each one of us this week, as we leave this place and we go home today and we wake up tomorrow by the grace of God, I don't know if we'll wake up tomorrow, but if we do, when you wake up tomorrow, remember these words. Do not be lazy, work hard, and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Do not be lazy, work hard, and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Like Paul, I appeal to you by the mercies of God in Christ Jesus. Do not be lazy, work hard, and serve the Lord with gladness of heart. May God bless us each as we seek to do that this week for His glory and for our good, for the good of the kingdom. So thankful that everyone's chosen to be here this morning in worship. But I don't want to conclude this morning without making sure that we offer the invitation and it's known that it is always standing. Maybe there's someone here who is not yet a child of God. You have yet to put Christ on. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27, it says, For all who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have put on Christ. And it's not just that. He's called us to believe. He's called us to confess. He's called us to change our life. But He's also called us to be made somebody new in Christ Jesus. And Romans 6 tells us that's exactly how it happens. Have you given yourselves fully to the transformative work of God through Jesus Christ? Benefited um, in the fullness from what He did on that cross as He shed His blood for you. If not, the invitation is yours this morning. You can respond. We stand ready and willing to help you. Um, maybe it is that you've done that, though, and you've, you've kind of lost touch with the service of the Lord, and you've lost the right disposition. Maybe you've kind of sunk back into some conformity to the world that's warmed about by Paul there. And we want to help you. We want to help you. It's, there's, while, the, while, there is, while there is life, there is still hope. And we understand that we have a loving Savior who is our advocate that 
in Christ, we can appeal to him and we can find their forgiveness of sins. We want to pray for you. We want to pray with you. We want to help you in any way that we can. Whatever your need may be this morning, let us know by coming forward as we stand and sing.